conservative force, there exists a potential energy. between the force and the potential energy is that the force is equal to minus the gradient of the potential energy. This purple doesn't seem to work. Um, and we talked last time about how to double check if a force is conservative. The easiest way is to take the curl of that force. If the curl is equal to zero, the force is conservative. If the curl is not zero, the force is not conservative. Okay? So our basic question at this point is, how do we find this potential energy? Okay? So of course, we have to know that our force is conservative to begin with. Otherwise, the potential energy doesn't exist. Okay? And again, we can double check that by checking that the curl of F is equal to zero. Um, and if it is, of course, then the potential energy is this. So the question is how to find it, okay? So um, we looked at an example last time. I said it would probably be easiest to illustrate this by looking at an example. So our force for this example was equal to x times y plus 2xz squared, the quantity times x hat, plus the quantity xz minus 1 times y hat, plus xy plus 2x squared z times z hat. And we checked last time, the very last thing we did before the end of class, that the curl of this force is equal to zero, which means that F is conservative. So that means the potential energy does exist, right? So the question is how to find it. Uh, by the way, you might be wondering why I used this example, because we actually had an earlier example of a conservative force. Um, uh, when we were first looking at how to do line integrals, right? The way to find the work done by a conservative force, uh, if an object moves from point A to point B along a certain path, remember is to take the integral of f dot dr or ds, whichever you want to call that infinitesimal displacement vector, uh, along the path. And we did several examples of such line integrals. Remember that for a conservative force, our answer did not depend on the path. So we had an example of a conservative force. We evaluated the work done going from point A to point B along several different paths. We got the same answer for all of them. We had an example of a non-conservative force. We got different answers for different paths in that case. You might be wondering why I didn't use the force that I, why I'm not using here the force I used in that example. Um, and the answer is because it, it, it ends up being too easy. And I want to show you the full complexity of what you have to think about as you do this technique. After I've shown this to you, though, we will come back and do that other example that we did last time of a conservative force. But, the, but I want to show it to you with this one, because this will illustrate something that the other one wouldn't. So again, we've already checked that this is a conservative force. Uh, there are actually two methods we can use to find the potential energy. So I'm going to show them both to you. I actually prefer method two for reasons that I will explain when we finish talking about it. Okay? But anyway, for method one, well, remember that the change in potential energy, if we go from point A to point B, in other words, u sub b minus u sub a, is equal to minus the work done by our force if we go from point A to point B. And so this is minus the integral of f dot dr, right? Because this integral is, of course, the work done by our force. Um, so we're going to basically use this expression to find delta u, and then we can sort of make a reasonable guess about u once we have delta u. Um, we're going to 
going to do it by actually evaluating this line integral. I should have put limits on here, right? Growing from point A to point B when we do this line integral. Uh, we're going to evaluate this for the case where point A is the origin to a point B, which has this sort of generic coordinates x, y, z. Okay? Uh, now, since f is conservative, the path doesn't matter. Right? For a conservative force, we should get the same answer for this work no matter what path from point A to point B we use. So let's pick a path that is going to make it easy to evaluate this integral. Okay? If this is the x, y coordinate, system like this, let's say here's our x-axis, here's our y-axis, here's our z-axis. Um, so we're going to start at the origin. So we're going to do one of these paths that has several steps, like we did in the examples of line integrals we did last time. So step one is going to be a straight line. from the origin to the point x0, 0. Okay? So in other words, we're going to move along the x-axis from the origin to some point that, again, we're not going to specify a number for the point on the x-axis, but we're just going to say to some x-coordinate that we'll just call x. Right? So this is the value of x here along the x-axis. I apologize for using the term x in sort of two different ways here, but I think it's clear what I mean. Okay, and then step two, we're going to do a straight line from the point we just arrived at, x0, 0, to the point x, y, 0, okay, for some generic value of y. So in other words, from here, we're going to move along a path like this until we're some distance y along the y direction. So this part of the path is going to be parallel to the y-axis. Okay? And then for step three, we're going to do a straight line from the point we just ended up at, x, y, 0, to the point x, y, z. So we're going to, in other words, keep x and y fixed and just move up in the z direction. To our final location, let's say right here. Okay? So step three, we're just going to move up a distance z parallel to the z axis. Okay? Right, so that's the path we're going to use from our point A to our point B. So here's our A, here's our B. Okay, um, so anyway. The work done by this force for this path. Um, well, let's substitute for the work, the work that we're using right here for this example. So again, there's a yz plus 2xz squared. Uh, now when we dot this into dr, okay, uh, f dot dr, of course, is going to give us f sub x times dx. Remember dr is dx times x hat plus dy times y hat plus dz times z hat. So when we dot it with f, we have the f component, the x component of f times the x component of dr, which is dx, plus the x component of, or I'm sorry, the y component of y, or of f, right? The y component of the force times the y component of dr. The y component of dr is dy, plus the z component of the force times the z component of dr, which is dz. Right? So we can read off f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z from over here plug that into this. So that's what I'm doing up here in the integrand. So this was f sub x. It's multiplied by dx. 
and f sub y was xz minus 1. That gets multiplied by dy. And f sub z was xy plus 2x squared z. And that gets multiplied by dz. Okay? Okay, so let's do step one of this path, okay? So along step one, we're varying the x-coordinate, but we're keeping both y and z fixed at a value of zero, okay? So y and z are both equal to zero along step one. Since y and z are constant and don't change, that means dy and dz, in other words, the changes in y and z are also zero. So if we evaluate the work for step one, let's call that w sub one. Again, we're going to use this expression up here, okay? But dy and dz are zero, so this term and this term are gone because of that. And in this term, we can set y and z equal to zero. That'll make both of these terms zero. So the whole thing is zero for step one. Okay. So step two, right? Step two, we are letting the y coordinate change from zero to y. We're keeping the x coordinate fixed and the z coordinate fixed, right? At zero. So x and z are held constant. In the x case, it's just equal to, again, what I call the generic value of x, but I'm, I am holding that constant. I'm not letting it vary now. And z is held being held fixed at 0. Okay? Well, anyway, since x and z are both constant, dx and dz are both 0. So the work done for step two, again, we're starting with this expression up here. So with dx equals zero, this whole term is gone. With dz equal to zero, this whole term is gone. So the only thing we've got left is this term right here. And in this term, we can plug in, let's just write it out like this first, xz minus one dy. But we can plug in the value of z equals zero Right, since z equals zero along this whole step, that's going to make that first term zero. So really all we have here is just minus dy. And now this is just an ordinary integral over y, so I can put limits on it, reflecting my starting value of y, which is zero, and my ending value of y, which is just the generic number I called y. So the limits are from zero to y. So, of course, when we evaluate this, integrate this and evaluate it, those limits will just get minus y. Okay, so step three. As we move along step three, it's the z coordinate that's changing. It's going from zero to z. Both x and y are being held constant at the values we got from the upper limits of the previous two integrals that we've done, okay? So now x and y are constant. And that means dx and dy are zero. So the work done for step three, we'll call that w3. Again, we're starting with this expression here, but this first term is all zero because of dx being zero. This is zero because of dy being zero. So all we've got left is this right here. So it's the integral of the quantity xy plus 2x squared z dz. Now, x and y we said are constant, OK? So when we do the integral in this next step here, we are going to pretend that x and y, not, I shouldn't just say pretend, but we're going to treat them as constants when we do this integral, okay? We're just integrating with respect to z. x and y could have just as well been some numbers, right, as far as we're concerned at this point. We're integrating over z, and of course we should put some limits on the integral. z goes from 0 to z, so 
those should be our limits. Okay? So, again, in the first term, x and y are both constants, and when we integrate that with respect to z, the x and the y just come along for the ride, so we get x times y times z. And in this second term, the x squared is a constant, it just comes along for the ride. The integral of 2z with respect to z would have given me, would give me a z squared. And I evaluate this at the limits from 0 to z. And remember, those are the limits for the value z is taking on, right? Because that's what I just integrated with respect to. Again, treat x and y like constants as I do this. So, of course, from the upper limit, I just get x, y, z plus x squared, z squared. And from the lower limit, when I set z equals to 0, of course, I get 0. So there's my answer for step three. Okay, so for a line integral, when we have several steps like this, we know that the total work done by this force for this whole path is equal to the sum W1 plus W2 plus W3, while W1 was zero, W2 was minus Y, and W3 was XYZ plus x squared z squared. Okay, so this is equal to the work done for this path. So we know that the change in potential energy, um, delta u, in other words, u at point b, which was our point x, y, z, minus u at point A, which was the origin, is equal to minus W. So therefore, it is equal to the negative of what I had up here. So in other words, it's y minus x, y, z minus x squared, z squared. OK, so. Um, We've got a little bit of a choice here. Actually, let's talk about what a choice is going to be in a minute. Um, I claim that this means that u at point x, y, z. So now think of u as a function of x, y, and z. It's going to be y minus x, y, z minus x squared z squared plus c, where c is a constant. c can take on any value. Right? It can be 0, it can be 2, it can be you know, 3.987, whatever. Okay? Um, okay, now technically this right here is the difference between two values of u. But what if I pick u as given by this expression right here? Well, then if I evaluate u at x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, again, all of those things equal to 0 here, all of those three terms are 0. So at u of, at the origin would just be equal to c, the constant. u at x, y, z, of course, would be given by this. So if I take this minus u at the origin, I'm taking this minus c, so the c cancels out. And for the difference delta u, I just get these first three terms in agreement with what this says. Okay? So I could pick that constant to be anything. The easiest choice, of course, is to pick c equals 0, in which case u will be equal to y minus x, y, z minus x squared, z squared. And usually when we um, are trying to find a potential energy, it'll always turn out, actually. It'll always turn out that we can add an arbitrary constant to the expression we get for the potential energy without changing it. Okay? And the easiest choice, of course, is to pick that constant equal to 0. That's what we'll usually do. Because usually we just care about finding some potential energy. We don't always necessarily want to have the most general possible expression for that potential energy. 
physically, this constant is analogous to the following kind of thing. You probably remember from 221, physics 221, that gravitational potential energy. Right? We'll use the symbol U again for gravitational potential energy. If we have a mass M and we hold it at some height up above our origin, so M is the mass here and H is the height, then the potential energy is M times G times H. G, of course, is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. The point is that this height, H, could be rel measured relative to any origin we want. We often will put our origin at the floor, or some, in some other problem, we might set our origin at the top of the table. Whatever is convenient, right? We can put our origin wherever we want. So in other words, we're picking some arbitrary location picked for our convenience at which we are saying the height and therefore also the potential energy at that location is zero. And as long as we don't change it in the middle of a problem, we can set that origin anywhere we want. Okay? It's kind of the same thing here. Potential energy is always undefined to within a constant. In other words, you could always add an arbitrary constant to it and it still will be a perfectly good potential energy. Okay? Um, that amounts to saying where, at what location, that potential energy is zero, just like it did for, for this one right here. I could have added a constant to this also. That just amounts to changing the origin that I'm measuring my heights relative to. So for this case, in this example, clearly if we pick this choice, if we pick that this constant is zero, then we are saying that this potential energy is equal to zero at the origin, right? At point x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero. That clearly will make this function equal to zero. So we are making the choice by choosing this constant equal to zero, we're deciding to make the potential energy zero at the origin as opposed to at some other point, okay? Okay, so um, anyway, we could, um, oh, let's not do the double check until the end. Okay, I told you there were two methods for finding the potential energy. This was method one, okay? So I want to show you method two, and I actually like method two better for reasons I will explain after we're done. times x hat plus the derivative of u with respect to y times y hat plus the derivative of u with respect to z times z hat. Okay, so the force is equal to that expression. Um, the force, of course, we could write as f sub x times x hat plus f sub y times y hat plus f sub z times z hat. Okay, and if any two vector expressions like that and this are equal to each other, their x components must be equal, their y components must be equal, and their z components must be equal. So in other words, this means that the x component of the force is minus the partial derivative of u with respect to x. Right? And it means that the y component of the force is minus the partial derivative of u with respect to, I'm sorry, with respect to y, and the z component of the force is minus du dz. Right? So all three of those would have to hold. Right? Um, well, let's think of what, what each of these means. 
for f sub x to be equal to minus du dx, let's try to invert this and sort of solve it for u. Um, if we get f sub x by taking a derivative of u with respect to x, then we should be able to find u by doing an integral of f sub x with respect to x. Now, of course, there's a minus sign there, so there will be a minus sign in the integral also. So you would be minus the integral of f sub x dx with the understanding, I'm just going to write it here out in words, that when we do this integral, we keep y and z fixed. We treat y and z as if they're constants. And the reason, of course, is that in this beginning expression, this was a partial derivative with respect to x. Right? And that, of course, means we're holding y and z fixed when we do those derivatives. So when we invert this derivative to get this integral, we also want to treat y and z like constants as we do this integral. Okay? Now, this is an indefinite integral, right? No limits on it. Normally, when we do an indefinite integral, we have to add in a constant of integration. But it's a little more complicated in this case. We can add in some arbitrary function of y and z. I'll call it f of y and z. Okay? And let's think about why that can be there by just imagining going backwards from this statement for you. Double check, go backwards and calculate minus du dx and see if we get f sub x. Right? Well, if we take the derivative of this, or minus the derivative of this u here with respect to x, the minus sign, of course, cancels the minus sign there. The partial derivative undoes this integral with respect to x in the first term, giving us f sub x. But this term, the f of y and z, of course, doesn't depend on x. It only depends on y and z. So when I take a partial derivative of this expression with respect to x, I get 0 from this term. Right? So I have to allow the possibility that this function could be there. I can't assume it will be 0. Okay? And you'll see why and what happens with an example as we do it in a moment for, for this example. Okay? Anyway, similarly, this expression, and if I try to solve this for you, I'll have to integrate, my, again, minus the integral because of the minus sign here, f sub y with respect to y with the understanding that when we do that integral, we treat x and z like constants. Again, because I had a partial derivative with respect to y here. Okay? And similar to the argument we made here, there could be some arbitrary function of x and z. We'll call it g of x and z uh, that could be added in, kind of like a constant of integration. Again, if you work backwards, right, take the derivative, partial derivative of this u here with respect to y, or minus the partial. From the first term, we'll get f sub y. We'll get 0 from the second term because it doesn't depend on y. Right, so it won't contribute to this partial derivative. But the point is, all three of these equations, I'm going to have a similar equation from this one. It's going to say that u is equal to minus the integral of f sub z dz, the understanding that I keep x and y fixed when I do that integral, plus some arbitrary function we'll call it h of x and y. Okay? Again, a similar reasoning for y that function there. Anyway, the point is, I have three equations now for you. And all three of these must hold. And they must hold individually. In other words, don't calculate a u this way and call it u1 maybe or something like that and a u2 maybe for this way and a u3 from this way and add them together. That's not what you want to do. But rather, instead of adding them, u has to satisfy each one separately. Okay? And you will need to double check that. And you will need to choose these arbitrary functions. <coughs> f of y and z, g of x and z, and h of x and y, 
So all of these agree. All three of these equations give you the same expression for you. Okay? Okay, so these are the equations I have to hold. Okay? So let's illustrate that for our example. Okay? So So again, for our example, f sub x was equal to yz plus 2xz squared. Right, that was the coefficient of x hat in the expression for the force. f sub y is xz minus 1. And f sub z is equal to xy plus 2x squared z. Okay, so so let's use the first one of these equations. Okay, u is equal to minus the integral of f sub x dx. Um, and the f of x, x is supposed to be squared by z. Of the z term? Well, f sub oh, x sorry, sorry. is this one. My bad. So sorry. that's okay. I yeah. think I, yeah. My okay. bad. I think they're okay. That's okay. It's easy to get those confused. No way to go out, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and then we've got plus f of y and z. Okay, so let's plug in f sub x into this integral. All right, so we've got minus the integral of yz plus 2xz squared dx plus f of y and z. Okay, I'm going to erase all this stuff, of course, to make room. But keep in mind that we already determined from method one that this is our potential energy for this example. Okay? So method two would better give us the same answer. Okay, so we got minus following it. Again, we're going to integrate with respect to x. Treat y and z like constants as we do it, okay? So the y and z just come for along for right, we get x, y, z then from that first term. From this second term, right, the x is a constant, or we treat it like it, or I'm sorry, the z is a constant, or we treat z like a constant. Um, so it just comes along for the ride. The integral of 2x dx, of course, gives us x squared. So we've got plus x squared z squared. Plus f of y and z. So there is our first expression for u. OK, we still don't know what f of y and z is. But let's leave that alone and go to the next one. Okay, we'll have to come back and figure out what f of y and z is in a minute. This one, this second expression for f sub y, we're going to use that in this equation. Right? So u is minus the integral of f sub y dy plus this function g of x and z. So let's plug in this expression here for f sub y. So this is minus the integral of the quantity xz minus 1 dy plus g of x and z. OK, so we'll leave the minus sign out in front. Uh, actually, let's just, just simplify this by the first expression. Let's multiply that minus sign here. So that's minus xyz minus x squared z squared <coughs> plus f of y and z. Okay? Okay, so in this expression, now when we do this integral, we're integrating with respect to y. 
the mean street x and z like constants. Okay? So that gives us x, z, y, or x, y, z. Obviously, we can write them in any order. Uh, minus 1, when we integrate minus 1 with respect to y, we get minus y plus g of x and z. So u, our tentative expression for u, uh, maybe let's do that in the first line also. Right? That equals u. Let's put a box around that. So we'll remember that's what we've got from that first expression so far. Similarly, from the second one, we're going to get minus x, y, z plus y plus g of x and z. So there's our tentative expression for u as derived from the second equation here. Now let's do the third equation. Okay? The third equation says that u is equal to minus the integral of f sub z dz plus h of x and y. So let's plug in for, d's, for f sub z this expression here. So minus the integral of the quantity xy plus 2x squared z dz plus h of x and y. So again, when we do this integral, we're integrating with respect to z. Just treat x and y like constants. Okay? So the minus sign out in front. So we'll get x, y, z from that first term. From the second term, the x squared is constant. It just comes along for the ride. But the integral of 2z dz gives us z squared. So we get a x squared z squared plus h of x and y. So our expression for u, distributing that minus sign through, is minus x, y, z minus x squared z squared plus h of x and y. So these three boxed equations, you have to satisfy all of those. Okay? So we have to choose the functions x or f, g, and h so that these all agree. So how can we choose them? Well, first of all, notice they all agree on some things already. All of them have an expression minus x, y, z in them. That's good. Uh, these two have a minus x squared, z squared. This one doesn't. But we can certainly choose g of x and z to be minus x squared, z squared. And then we'll have that term in all of them also. Let's see, this one has a y that this one and this one don't have. But our f of y and z, let's choose that to be equal to our h of x and y. Let's choose both of those to be y. Okay. Then all three of those expressions would have a minus x, y, z. All three of them would have a minus x squared, z squared. And all three of them would have a y. Okay. Now, notice, okay, I, I better make sure when I choose these functions, f, g, and h, that they can only depend on the variables I said they can depend on. Right? This one can only be a function of x and z. Well, it is. That's good. This one could depend on both y and z, but it doesn't have to. I can pick it to be only a function of y, and that's still OK. Right? Uh, it could not, however, depend on x. Right? Similarly, this one could depend on x and y, but it doesn't have to depend on both. So if I pick it just to be y, this will work. All three of these functions will agree. But it certainly could not depend on z. Okay? So anyway, if I pick those functions as shown, then this is my answer for you. 
Now, actually, I could add an arbitrary constant to this also. Because, to be honest, what I could have done, um, in my g and f and h, I could have included some arbitrary constants also. So for example, I could have included a constant, maybe I'll call it c1 as part of g. Uh, and as part of f and h, I could include another constant of c2, and then I could combine the c1 and the c2 to get c. I, I'm always allowed to include an arbitrary constant. Uh, the simplest choice is, of course, to choose that to be 0, in which case it's just gone. In any case, this potential energy agrees with what we got doing method 1. Okay, So both methods will work. Okay. Um, Uh, okay, oh, by the way, as a double check, um, we know that F is supposed to be given by minus the gradient of U. Okay? And of course, in Cartesian coordinates, this will be minus du dx times x hat, minus du dy times y hat minus d u d z times z hat. So let's take the u that we have found, our answer, and use it here. Okay? Uh, and we should get the force back that we started with. That's just to double check that we haven't made any mistakes along the way. Okay, so if this is u, Taking minus the derivative of it with respect to x, that will be the coefficient of x hat. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, differentiating with respect to x, of course, treating y and z like constants. Uh, from this first term, we'll get minus yz. From the second term, we'll get minus 2xz squared. Uh, nothing from the y, and of course nothing from the constant. Right? So that's it for du dx. This gets multiplied by x hat. We also have a minus du dy times y hat, so figure out du dy. From the first term we get minus xz. Nothing from this term, it doesn't depend on y. From this term we get a plus 1 and nothing, of course, from the constant term. So this times y hat, and finally minus du dz times z hat. du dz is minus xy minus 2x squared z. Nothing from the y term, and of course, nothing from the constant. So anyway, if you just distribute these minus signs through, all right, that will give you yz plus 2xz squared times x hat plus xz minus 1 times y hat plus xy plus 2x squared z times z hat. And if we haven't screwed up, that should agree with the force we were given back here at the beginning, right? And it does. <clears throat> um, let me show you why I gave you this more complicated example for the force in this case, rather than using the simple, right? We had, from last time, another force that we already determined to be conservative. Uh, remember we did, several different line integrals from point A to point B for it. We found that we got the same answer for them all that made us suspect that our force was conservative. But then once we determined that we could verify if a force is conservative or not by taking its curl and checking if its curl was zero, we found that the curl of this force was zero, so we know it's conservative. So 
Okay, so last time, we considered this conservative force It was a two-dimensional example because I wanted to draw paths in the xy plane on the board. Uh, and so the example was y times x hat plus x times y hat. Right? And we double checked that that is conservative. So let's find the potential energy associated with this one. And let's again use method two. I still haven't explained to you why I prefer this method, but I will in just a few minutes. Okay? Um, so anyway, method two <coughs> involved looking at f as the minus the gradient of u. That meant the components of f were related to the partial derivatives of u by these equations here. And integrating these, we found these three expressions for u, all of which we have to satisfy. Okay? So u is equal to minus the integral of f sub x dx plus our function f of y and z. Uh, so let's plug in f sub x. The x component of the force is the, component of the coefficient of x hat, in other words, y. So this is minus the integral of y dx plus f of y and z. Remember, we treat y as a constant when we do this integral. We're integrating with respect to x. So this gives us minus xy plus f of y and z. The second one of those equations says f is minus the integral of f sub y dy plus g of x and z. f sub y is equal to x, so this is minus the integral of x dy plus g of x and z. Remember, we treat x as a constant when we do this integral. We're integrating with respect to y, so this gives us minus xy plus g of x and z. And the third one's probably going to be irrelevant because u is since this is a two-dimensional case, we kind of expect that you will depend on x and y, but not on z anyway. But the third one should still be true. So we could still double check it. F sub z is, of course, 0. There is no z component. So this is just h of x and y. Okay. Okay, so anyway, to make these all agree, <coughs> um, we can pick both f of y and z and g of x and z be a constant, or better yet, pick that constant to be 0, uh, and h of x and y, well, that's all we've got in that expression for u, so let's pick it to be minus xy to match the minus xy we've already got in those expressions, um, and I'm going to add a constant to both of those, let's include a constant in that also. Right, so then all of our expressions for you will agree, they're all minus xy plus a constant. And of course, we can choose that constant to be zero if we like. That's our simplest possible choice. Here's why I didn't want to do this as my only example, though. Right, in this case, I got away with picking f and g to be equal to constant, or perhaps even zero if I pick that constant to be zero. You might think that based on this example, therefore, you could always get away with choosing these to be zero or, or a constant. And then you don't have to worry about them. And sometimes that will happen, like in this example. But it doesn't always happen. So I wanted to show you an example where I couldn't pick these all to be zero. And that's what our first example did for us. Yeah? On the last u, should that be negative h of uh, at yx? Uh, 
Where? On the last one. Last one. Yeah, you have negative integral. Negative. So and so that equals. Uh, equals well, H. I I didn't I didn't have parentheses around this. Okay. I had a minus sign in front of the integral, but the minus sign wasn't around like that whole quantity. <clears throat> I mean, I could have put it that way if I wanted to. I mean, if this is an arbitrary function, the negative of it is also an arbitrary function. So I mean, I could have actually defined it that way when I set it up, but I did. So if I want to be consistent with what I've written before, I think it's correct as it, as it stands. Okay. So this negative sign included that, but it wasn't in front of that. Okay, so again, I, I just didn't want you to think that you could always choose these arbitrary functions to be zero, because often you can't, right? In our first example, if I picked all those functions f, g, and h to be zero, these three expressions wouldn't agree, and they have to agree. So sometimes I'll have to pick non-zero functions for those things. And I want, so again, I wanted to show you an example where you had to do that, okay? Okay, um, let's answer the following question. What if, you know, we should only be using these techniques to find potential energies. We should only be using them for a case of a conservative force. Because we know that if a force is non-conservative, the potential energy doesn't exist. So we should always check that our force is conservative to begin with. In other words, check that the curl is zero before we go about trying to find a potential energy. Uh, and we did that for both of these examples we just looked at. But what if we forget to do that or we're lazy um, and we start trying to find a potential energy if, the, if our force is not conservative? What will happen? Okay? Let, me, let me illustrate with an example what will happen if we try to do that. This actually gets back to why I said I prefer method two instead of method one. Okay, so what happens? If we try to find a potential energy for a non-conservative force. Uh -huh. Is there a similar check for method one that we have for method two, or we can just um, take the gradient? Sure, sure. That check, whether you use method well, one or method two, okay. you could still do that check that way. Okay, okay yeah, because you're still being So that's not a part of either method. Just, okay. just take the U that you've got, whether you got it by using method one or method two, take minus uh, 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 the gradient of it and see if you get the original force you started with. Okay. Okay, well, what if we use method one? In method one, nothing goes wrong during our actual method. We can only find our mistake at the end when we do that double check you just asked about. <coughs> In other words, we will find that if we take minus the gradient of the tentative u that we have gotten by using method one, we will find that we get an expression that is not equal to the force we started with. Okay, and that will alert us that something is wrong. But until we do that double check at the end, everything will look like it's going along just fine. Okay? But method two, and this is why I prefer method two, um, it simply won't work. And that will tell us that we're trying to do this in a situation where we shouldn't, that our force isn't conservative to begin with, and therefore U doesn't exist. Um, so let's, let me try to show you an example of what happens with method two if you try to do this, okay? OK, 
Okay, so let's look at the example of the force that we considered last time and found to be non-conservative, namely y squared times x hat plus x squared times y hat. Again, we considered this in an example last time. We calculated the um, uh, line integral to get the work, in other words, the work as f dot dr, uh, from, I believe it was from the origin to the point 24, I think? Um, something like that. And um, via three different paths, we found three different answers, so that told us since the work done depended on the path, our force was non-conservative. We also double checked that the curl of this was non-zero, right? And that tells us it's not a conservative force. So let's say we didn't know it was non-conservative, and we're going to try to find a potential energy for it anyway, using method two, and that means using these three equations right here. Let's see what happens. Okay, so our first expression, first equation there for you, tells us it's minus the integral of f of x dx plus some function f of y and z. By the way, don't use the same names for these three functions, because if you did, that would imply they were all equal to each other. And they don't have to be. In fact, they really can't be, because they depend on different variables, right? So use, th I mean, I don't care if you call them fg and h or something else, but use three different names, right? F1, F2, and F3, just three different names for those functions, okay? Okay, so anyway, the first equation, well, f sub x is equal to y squared. So let's substitute that. So this is minus the integral of y squared dx plus f of y and z. Remember, we treat uh, y as a constant when we do this integral. We're integrating just with respect to x. So that will give us minus xy squared plus f of y and z. So there is our first expression for you. The second equation. Plug in for f sub y, f sub y is equal to x squared. Okay, so again we treat x as a constant when we do that integral. So we get minus x squared y plus g of x and z. Our second expression. The third expression for u is minus the integral of f of z dz plus h of x and y. Well, f sub z was zero, so this is just tells us u is equal to h of x and y, some arbitrary function of x and y. So all three of these equations have to agree. Well, here's the problem. There is no way of choosing these functions f of y and z, g of x and z, and h of x and y. There's no way of choosing them so that these agree. terms are not equal, even though at first glance, you know, you might say they are, but one of them has it's the y that's squared, the other one has the x that's squared. So they're not the same. Uh, and furthermore, right, I can't pick this function to give me that term there that I'm missing, 
because the term that I need depends on x and y, but the function I'm allowed to pick here depends on x and z, but not y. So there's no way of picking a function at g of x and z to give me a term that looks like that. Similarly, there's no way of picking an f of y and z to give me the term that looks like this that's missing in this expression. Right? The term I need depends on x and y, but I'm allowed to only pick a function that depends on y and z. Okay? Um, now, of course, this, the h of x and y, I could pick to be minus xy squared minus x squared y, and that would give me the terms I need to agree with both of those. But there's no way I can make these two agree with each other. Okay? So there's no way I can pick these functions to give me one single expression for you. And that tells me at that point that either the force I started with was non-conservative, which was the case here, or that I made a mistake somewhere along the way. Okay? So again, method two, if you try to do it for non-conservative force, you'll find something like what we just found. There's no, not going to be any way of picking these functions, f, g, and h, so that all three expressions for you agree. Okay? Method one, on the other hand, like I said, nothing goes wrong during the method itself, it looks like everything's okay, there's no sign that you're trying to do it in a case where you can't do it, the only problem will be a, the double check at the end won't work. Okay? That's why I prefer method two instead of method one. But feel free to use whichever method you prefer. Okay? So if you get to this point, are you better off trying to recheck your calculations or just going ahead and taking the curl of the force? I would probably just go ahead and take the curl, well, really you should have taken the curl of the force before you started. Okay. But if you forgot to do so, I would at this point do it. Um, and if the curl is non-zero, then you shouldn't have been trying to find a potential energy anyway. If the curl was zero, then it means you made a mistake. So then go back and double check. That's good also if you already know ahead of time that it is a conservative force. You don't have to do the curl. And then if you made it, if you notice there's a mistake somewhere, you're like, oh, it's in my calculation. Yeah. So that's yeah. not bad. Right. So if you've checked ahead, it's a conservative force. And at this point, you're getting it looking like it's not going to work. Then, like you say, then you know you've made a mistake. And that helps you narrow down where you might have made the mistake. Yeah. OK. OK, so we're going to kind of switch gears here for a minute. Right? We've talked a lot about uh, work and line integrals and potential energies and so forth. Um, and we will come back to some of those ideas. But, um, but let's look at something else for a moment. Okay, so let's think about a scalar field of, let's call it Q of X and Y. So this is obviously in two dimensions, right? We're looking at this as a function of X and Y, not X, Y, and Z. Uh, so this is scalar field. So again, you know, this is a function of both x and y, or it means that every point is space labeled by some value of x and y. There will be a number sitting at that point in space, right? That number is given by by this function q. Um, and let's assume that the first partial derivatives of this function with respect to both x and y, in other words, dq dx and dq dy, uh, are both continuous. <coughs> Let's evaluate the following integral. some area in the xy plane. So I've called that area A. I've put it down here to indicate that we can use it in some way, perhaps in a moment, to write down limits of integration. Um, and anyway, here, if this is the xy plane, this is going to be the area A we'll pick. So we'll pick it to be a rectangle. With its left and right sides at x equals a and x equals b respectively, and its bottom and top 
at y equals c and y equals d respectively. Okay, okay so anyway, the integral we want, right, if we actually write limits on it, is going to go from A to B, Y is going to go from C to D, to cover that rectangle. Um, so you can imagine putting parentheses or brackets like this, right? So in other words, let's do the X integral first and then we'll do the Y integral. So the X integral, well, since the integrand involves a derivative with respect to X, integrating with respect to X just undoes that integral and gives us, we've still got the Y integral out in front. But inside the square brackets, we just get the function Q of X and Y. Right? Again, the integral undoes the derivative but since it was a definite integral, we have to evaluate it at the limits. So evaluate it at right, x equal, and, and I put the x equals there just to make it clear that it's x that I'm setting equal to a or b for the limits instead of y, right, since q is a function of both things. Um, and then I've still got the integral with respect to y that I haven't done yet. Okay, so inside this integral, when I evaluate the, the limits, I'm going to have first q of b and y, right? When I set x equals to b, and then minus, minus because it's a lower limit, q of a and y, right? x gets set equal to a. Okay, and then I still have the integral with respect to y. Now I'm not going to try to do that integral with respect to y. Let me just leave it like that for the moment. Okay. Um, so I'm going to maybe just call that result number one. Okay, and let's evaluate another integral. I'll call it integral number two. We're going to get the same thing when we evaluate integral number two. I'm just trying to show you that very well. Okay? So, let's now evaluate the this integral right here. Okay, this is going to be a line integral around the curve C. C is a closed curve. Remember, a circle on an integral sign indicates we're integrating around a closed curve. Um, and C is going to form the boundary of the area A that we that we did the area integral over there for. Okay? So we're going to take the function Q of X and Y, multiply it by dy. So we're notice we're integrating over Y but not over X. Okay? And we are going to integrate around this curve, so again, if here's the xy plane, here was our area A. The curve C is going to be this curve here that just forms the boundary of that rectangle. Um, and notice that when we go around, when we do a line integral, we go around the curve in a particular direction. And notice that in this case, I am choosing to do it counterclockwise. Okay. Okay. So again, we're integrating with. Respect 
respect to y, not with respect to x. So on the horizontal sections of this path, right, a line integral around a curve that consists of several straight line segments like this, we know we can split it up into a sum for each segment, right? Like the line integrals, we did that way last time. So there will be four steps, right, to this line integral. Two of the steps, along the top and along the bottom, that's what I mean by the horizontal sections here. Of course, on those horizontal sections, y remains constant. which means dy equals zero along those sections. And since we're integrated, since there's a dy in here, that means those sections have no contribution to the result. sections. On the right hand side, remember x was equal to a and b right there on the two sides. So on the right hand side, x is equal to b and y, when we integrate, goes from C and D. On the right hand side, we're starting at the bottom and going up, right? So we're starting at Y equals C and going to Y equals D. So Y goes from C to D. On the left hand side, on the other hand, <coughs> X will be equal to A, right? Along the left hand side. And we're going downward, again, we're going around counterclockwise, so we're going in the direction of the arrow. So y starts out at d and goes to c. So therefore, this integral um, will be the integral of q of b and y, dy, integrated from c to d. That's for the right-hand side, right? We've just written the same integral over, but we replaced x by b. And so if we're integrating over y, we can put limits. And those limits show that we start out at point c and go to point d. Okay? Um, and on the left-hand side, right, we add the result of doing the left-hand side to this. So on the left-hand side, write the same integral, but now x is set equal to a. So we have q of a and y dy. And we're integrating over dy, so we can put in limits showing the starting and ending values of y, namely d to c. Well, let's combine these integrals together. Right? They are both integrals over dy. Um, and if we flip the limits on this one, then they'll both have limits of c to d. But we know if we flip the limits, we change the sign. Right? So if we write this as a single integral from c to d, our integrand will have to be q of b y minus q of d y dy. Right? Again, by flipping the limits here so that it's also c to d, we just change the sign right there, which carries over to the minus sign right there. Well, let's get rid of all this stuff from our previous discussion.
notice that the result we just got over there is exactly the same as the result we have over here from evaluating this first interval. Okay? So our expression one and our expression two agree. So that tells us that the double integral of dq dx integrated over both x and y, covering this area A, that rectangle that we looked at over there, is equal to the line integral of q and x of x and y dy integrated over this curve C that forms the boundary of this area A, assuming we go around it counterclockwise like we did here. Okay? So these two integrals are equal. Um, similarly, there are two other integrals that are equal. Let me write the result and then I'll work it out for you to show you. But if you look at another scalar field, P of X and Y, Right, this first result was true for a scalar field Q of X and Y. So let's think about another scalar field P of X and Y. Let's write an integral similar to this one right here, except instead of dQ dx, we'll look at a dP dy. We're still going to integrate over this area A, the same rectangle. Okay? And we're going to show that that is equal to the integral of p of x and y dx integrated over the curve c that again forms the boundary of a. I'm sorry, this one had a minus sign in front here. Okay, let me prove this one in a similar way to the way we proved the first one. Okay. Let's again evaluate expression one and expression two. So expression one will be we'll have a derivative of p with respect to y and we'll integrate over both x and y so as to cover this rectangle A. Again, A is the same rectangle in the xy plane with sides at x equals a, x equals b, y equals c, and y equals d. Okay? Um, so again, we could write limits. Let me actually reverse the order of these angles. I should be able to do them in either order. So let me put the y one on the inside, because we'll put brackets around it like that. So this inner one, y, is going to go from c to d. And on the outer integral, x is going to go from a to b. Well, we're going to make a similar argument to what we did for 1 over here. In this inner integral, we're integrating over y, but there's a derivative with respect to y, so the integral just undoes the derivative. So x is still going from a to b, but now inside the square brackets, uh, we have p of x and y. But now it's evaluated at y equals c and d, right, our limits of integration. And we've still got the outside integral with respect to x. OK, so. Inside the square brackets, when we evaluate p at the limits, we'll have p of x and d from the upper limit minus p of x comma c at the lower limit. Okay, So that's what we get from doing that integral. Uh, and then for comparison, let's consider 
Uh, Rick, notice what I just evaluated there for number one is the left-hand side here, except I've left out the minus sign. Let's evaluate the right-hand side now. So now we've got the line integral of p of x and y dx integrated around this curve c. c is once again the same curve that I talked about before. It's the boundary of a going around counterclockwise. Um, so on the vertical sides, right, there's four pieces to this line integral for each side of that rectangle. On the two vertical sides, x is being held constant. And that means dx is 0. And since we're integrating with respect to x, right, that's going to make those two sides have no contribution to this integral. On the horizontal side, right, on the top side, y is being held fixed at the value d. And we're going from right to left across the vertical side, so x goes from b to a. On the bottom, y is being held fixed at the value c. And we're going from left to right, so x is starting out at a and going to b. So, On the bottom, we've got p of x and c, right, because x is equal to c. And we've got a dx. x goes from a to b, so we can write those as our limits. On the top side, y is equal to d, so we've got p of x and d, dx. And x goes from b to a, so those are our limits. Well, if we can make these limits both the same, we can combine them both into one integral. If we flip these limits so that these ones are going from a to b, same as these ones, then that will change the sign of this right here. So we can write one integral from a to b. In the integrand, we now have p of x and c minus p of x and d, dx. Well, if you compare expression 1 and expression 2 here, notice that they agree except for a sign. They both have limits from a to b. They both have two different functions p, the difference of which are in the integral. They're both integrated with respect to x. The only difference is we've got d there and c there in this term whereas it's opposite in here. So in other words, expression one is the negative of expression two. And that's exactly what we had over here, right? This was expression two, this was minus expression one, okay? So both of these expressions uh, are, are s proven in similar ways, okay? And you can obviously see the sort of symmetries there in the way that, that, that they're written. Anyway, let's combine these two equations. side here plus the right hand side here. And so that's going to give us on the left hand side uh, an integral over the area A of the quantity dq dx 
minus dp dy, and we're integrating over both x and y, so we're integrating over an area here. And so this is equal to the line integral over the curve C of P dx plus Q dy. Okay, this is an important result. It's called Green's theorem in a plane, or a two-dimensional Green's theorem. Okay? Um, so notice that on the left-hand side, we have an integral over an area, whereas on the right-hand side, we have a line integral around a curve that forms the boundary of the area that we're talking about here. And I should perhaps also remind you that when we do this line integral, we are going around the curve in the counterclockwise direction. Or perhaps another way of remembering that, go back to the picture here, as we go around the curve, we are keeping the area A to our left. Okay? It's another way of saying that we're going around it counterclockwise. Okay, um, well, we derived this for a rectangle A. But this is true for any area A. It doesn't have to be just a rectangle, even though that's how we proved it. And let me try to convince you that that's true. Let's say that we've got some kind of area A that is shaped in some irregular shape like this. Okay. Um, let me actually move that label out here because I want to draw something else inside of it. Um, we could take that area and we could divide it up into little boxes, little rectangles, right, by doing something like this. The integral over an area A that is an irregular shape like this is simply the sum of the integrals over all those individual rectangles that make it up. And for each rectangle, you know that Green's theorem is true. Um, so, so if you apply this to any area A, this left-hand side is just going to be, again, a sum of that same left-hand side, but added up for all the individual little rectangles that make this up. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, um, let's say we've got two little rectangles like this, one on top of the other. We're going to go around each of them in the counterclockwise direction. So the top one, we're going to go around like this. And the bottom one, let me actually displace the bottom of the top one and the top of the bottom rectangle from each other a little bit just so that you can see which arrow goes with which. Uh, although in reality they lie right on top of each other, right? But we're also going around this one counterclockwise, so that means the arrows go like this. And so notice on this boundary, the shared boundary right here between those two boxes, when we do this integral over the top hand box, we're going from this point to this point, right, left to right. But when we do the integral over the bottom box, we're going from right to left in the opposite direction. That's essentially just flipping the limits of integration. And we know that all that does is introduce a sign change. So in other words, the contributions, the contribution on that bottom edge of that box from the top box, K 
cancels the contribution from the top edge of the bottom box. And so those contributions cancel. Of these two boxes cancel on this shared boundary. Okay, and of course you could make a similar argument, right? If we go to another box, let's say to the right of this box, and we go around it counterclockwise, then along this shared boundary right here, we're going up from that box to down for the other box, and those contributions cancel in a similar way. So along every shared boundary between these boxes, we'll have that kind of cancellation going on. And so the only contributions that don't cancel in this way are the ones along the outside edge of this area A. And if I've got a box like this box up here, when I go around it counterclockwise like that, of course, the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and the bottom side will be canceled by the contributions of the neighboring box. But on the top side, we don't have a neighboring box to cancel. So we'll have that contribution left. So we'll have that contribution of going from right to left across the top. Of course, we'll also have right to left from the next box over from the same direction. And so if we combine all the boxes that way, we'll basically be going around this entire boundary like that in the counterclockwise direction. And furthermore, if we make these boxes infinitesimal in size, we can match the shape of any kind of curved boundary we like by doing that. Okay? So that's our argument. Even though we proved Green's theorem only for the case where A was a rectangle, by this argument right here, we can generalize it to any area whatsoever. Okay? Okay, so A here is any area, and C is the boundary of that area. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to be looking at lots of consequences of Green's theorem as we go on. Okay. Um, again, this is true for any, right, P and Q here are any scalar fields that they're both functions of X and Y, in other words. And so scalar fields in two dimensions with continuous partial derivatives. So depending on what we pick for P and Q, there'll be lots of different things we can derive from this. There might be a situation where we want to look at P and Q being equal to each other. There are situations where we might want to pick P and Q being different, but maybe, for example, P is the X component of some vector field, and Q is the Y component, or vice versa. There will be lots of consequences we'll derive by looking at different choices for P and Q like that. But before we get to that, let me just show you why this by itself is, is sometimes useful. Um, and the reason is because you know, we know that this area integral and this line integral are now equal to each other. Sometimes we might have an integral to do that is of one of these forms that may not be so easy to do, but by using Green's theorem and replacing it by the other expression that Green's theorem tells us it's equal to, we might end up with an integral that is easier to do. Okay? So let me give you an example. Um, and I'm not sure either of these is particularly easier. But let me give you a particular choice of the area A and a choice for P and Q. And I will evaluate both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of Green's theorem just to convince you that they're equal, that Green's theorem works like, like it should. So let's 
let's say there are x and y axes. Let's label some numbers. 0 through 4 on the x-axis and 0 through 2 on the y-axis. And let's define an area A as this area right here. We're going to go around it, of course, in the counterclockwise direction to form the curve C. So this area A is bounded by the x-axis on the bottom, uh, the line x equals 4, right, it's forming the right hand edge, and then the top is this curve, and the curve is defined by the equation y equals the square root of x. Notice that of course x equals 4, if I plug that in gives me y equals 2, so clearly this point right here is on that curve as is point zero, 0, and that's what the curve looks like in between them. And let's find the work done by the force F equals Y squared X hat plus X squared Y hat. This is a force that we have previously found to be non-conservative. Okay, it's the one we've used in a couple of examples until now. Find the work done by this force um, in moving around this closed path C that I've shown you here in the counterclockwise direction. If we had been doing this problem with a different force that was a conservative force, Zero. what would our answer be? Zero. Right. Okay. We know that for any closed path, a conservative force does zero work. That's one of the things we talked about last time for conservative forces. Okay? So if I had given you conservative force, it would be a pretty trivial problem. But the force is non-conservative, and therefore we probably won't get zero. Okay? So um, there are two methods we're going to do this. Method one, I could say, is the direct method. Okay? Um, the work done by this force is the integral of f dot dr around this curve C, okay? around this closed curve. Well, again, f is this right here, right? So f is y squared x hat plus x squared y hat. We're going to dot that into dr, which is dx times x hat plus dy times y hat. So the result will be y squared x dx plus x squared, I'm sorry, there is no x here. That was an x hat, and of course when I dot that into that, I just get y squared dx. Of course, this dotted into this gives 0, as does this dotted into this, and this dotted into this gives me x squared dy. Okay, so um, this is, of course, going to be a sum of the integral for, let me call this step 1, step 2, and step 3. So this will be an integral for step one plus an integral for step two plus an integral for step three. It's the same integrand on all three. I just haven't bothered to write it out. Okay? So step one. Step one, we're moving along the x-axis. Okay? So y is being held fixed at the value of zero. And since y is fixed, dy is 0. So 
So the integral of y squared dx plus x squared dy along step one will be zero. This term is zero because dy is zero. This term is zero because y is zero. Right? For step two. Along step two, going from here to here, x is being held constant at a value of four. And since x is constant, dx is zero. So the integral of y squared dx plus x squared dy along step two. Well, dx is zero, so this first term is zero. In the second term, we can plug in x equals four. So um, x squared will be 16. That can, of course, be moved in front of the integral. Then we're just integrating over step two. And in step two, right, we're integrating over y. Y is starting out at a value of zero and going to a value of two. So this gives us 16 times two is 32. OK, um, step three. <coughs> of y with respect to x times dx. Well, the derivative of y with respect to x, we're going to x to the 1 half. So differentiating, we get uh, 1 half times x to the minus 1 half. In other words, the square root of x in the denominator, and then times dx. So step three, the integral of y squared dx plus x squared dy. Let's substitute for y right here, right? So y squared will be x. So that first term is just x dx. And the second term, let's leave the x squared alone, but substitute for the dy. That's dx over 2 times the square root of x. Well, let's combine these terms. Now it's just a single, simple integral over x. Um, we've got an x dx from the first term plus, let's see, an x squared is an x to the 4 halves divided by x to the 1 half is x to the 3 halves. So 1 half times x to the 3 halves dx. Or in other words, um, x plus 1 half times x to the 3 halves quantity dx. We can put limits. Uh, x is going from 4 and it's ending up at 0. So our limits are from 4 to 0. I could have put them at a previous stage here, actually. Okay, so going ahead and integrating this, the integral of x dx gives us x squared over 2. Um, and this one, let's see, we're going to x to the 3 halves, so we increase the power by 1, that'll give us an x to the 5 halves. And we divide by the new power, so dividing by 5 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 fifths, in which case the 2 cancels with the 1 half in front. So, um, so we get a um, one-fifth. And we have to evaluate these at the limits. Of course, from the upper limit, zero, we get nothing. From the lower limit, we'll get a minus sign, of course, because it's a lower limit. So when we plug in, let's see, x4 squared over 2 is 16 over 2 is 8. 
And 4 to the 5 halves is 4 squared times the square root of 4. In other words, 16 times 2 is 32. So minus 32 fifths, again minus because it's a lower limit. And if you put those over a common denominator and combine them, I'll let you double check that you get minus 72 fifths. So anyway, the work done then is the work done for step one plus the work done for step two plus the work done for step three. We got zero for step one, 32 for step two, and minus 72 fifths for step three. <coughs> I'll let you double check that if you put those over a common denominator, you find that the total work is 88 fifths. Okay? Yeah? So was the first force equation, is this supposed to be a y hat again? Uh, find work done by force. Uh, oh. Here, right a little. And down. And the square of y hat. X squared y. X squared uh, y. y squared x half plus x squared y. Mm -hmm. Right about where you're pointing. You're pointing at it right now. Oh, oh, here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, that was supposed to be a y half. I'm sorry I forgot it. Um, okay, it looks like we're out of time. I wanted to show you that this is an example of Green's theorem. Notice that the integral that we're doing right here, right, before we evaluate it any further, certainly looks like an example of the right